So we, what we're going to do is we're going to continue <clears throat> with uh, our teachings on, on biblical courtship and marriage. This one, one, this one here is number three. Number three, and I've entitled this one, Teen Dating and the Biblical Prerequisites for Marriage. Okay? Teen Dating and the Biblical Prerequisites for, made, for Marriage. <laughs> Oops! Uh, how does dating, and, and what we want to do in, in this teaching is we want to look at how does dating match up with the biblical prerequisites and purposes for marriage, okay? How does dating match up with the biblical prerequisites and purposes for marriage, okay? And I'm going to, I'll tell you why we're going to do that, but we we'll just give a little review here. So the first teaching that we did was entitled The Biblical Prerequisites for Marriage from Genesis 1 through 2. And so what we did is we looked at this, we looked at Genesis 1 through 2 where Adonai created Adam and Eve. And what we did is we looked at all of the circumstances there and we what we did is we chose what the prerequisites for marriage were. Okay? So in other, in other words, when Adonai introduced marriage uh, in Genesis 1 through 2, uh, we should assume that uh, that certain prerequisites were met, otherwise he would not have done it. Okay, so for instance, I'll give you an obvious one. We said that one of the prerequisites for marriage was that it be between a man and a woman, <laughs> right? I mean, that's how Adonai did it, right? So we kind of went through Genesis 1 through 2 and just looked at the text and said, okay, here's another, these are the different prerequisites, okay? So <clears throat> in last week's teaching, teaching number two, what we did is, is we, uh, we looked at will it be dating or courting, okay? Will it be dating or courting? You know, how, what method are we going to choose in order to find our spouse? And so there were two things that we did in that teaching. We, we did, we did a, a general survey of the process of modern dating, you know, what happens in, in, in dating. And when I say modern, I mean, you know, for the past half a century or so, which is, which is winning really when it kind of came on the scene and got really strong, at least over here in America. We did that, and then the other thing that we did, which was very, very important, it was very important, was we looked at a more biblical definition of, of intimacy and how dating involves most of the levels of intimacy reserved for marriage, okay? Okay, so we looked at, we, we, we looked into that word intimacy because we typically kind of think of it as one thing, right? Uh, so we've got a mix audience of ages here, so I'm just going to, it'll be a lot of innuendo with a lot of things, but normally people think of one thing when you hear the word intimacy, but it's not. It involves so many other things, and we're going to talk about that, and a lot of those things occur during dating, okay, and so we wanted to look at that, and so we looked at the different levels of intimacy, So, and today, uh, what we're going to do is teen dating and the biblical prerequisites for marriage. So in other words, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to compare dating to those prerequisites we saw in uh, in the first teaching to see whether or not we should be participating in it as Adonai's people. OK. And so uh, one of the things that I hope to show today is that dating is the wrong institution for preparation for marriage. OK. Dating, the, the way we do modern dating today is not the biblical way that we should prepare for marriage, okay? All right, so this first part is what then shall you do, okay? And I want to talk about the silence of the Bible uh, about this concept of dating, courtship, and, and betrothal. Now, the Bible talks a lot, it has numerous verses about singlehood, people who are, who are single, okay? When Jephthah said, the first thing that comes out of my door, I'm going to sacrifice it unto the Lord, because of the fact that we know what a home burnt offering is, we understand that he did not slay his daughter. She took a vow to not be married. Okay? She remained single her entire life. And in that way, she was offered as an Ola. Um, but the, the Bible doesn't say anything about dating. Okay? But then someone could say to me, and I couldn't, and I could not deny it, the Bible doesn't say anything about courting either. It really doesn't. It doesn't say anything about courting, not specifically. So you can say, well, where are you getting all this courting stuff? Well, we'll get to that. 
The Bible does talk about betrothal and marriage, though. It does talk about betrothal and marriage. Um, and so when you think about it, <clears throat> so we're going to go through the scriptures and we're going to look and see how this was done. So, for instance, Isaac and Rebekah, that is one example right there where the father, through Eliezer, Abraham found a wife for Isaac. He found a wife for Isaac. Now, when he, when Eliezer brought her back, there was, there was, there was no dating. We already know that. There wasn't any courting either, <laughs> right? There was no courting. That's what I said. Sometimes the Bible is silent on this. What happened was Eliezer brought her back and said, "This is your wife. <laughs> this is your wife." And you know what the scripture says? The scripture says, "And Isaac." loved Rebecca. Now how can that be? How can it be that a man could go to a faraway land and come back and bring a woman and set her in is Victor, supposing your dad did that, Victor. <laughs> You're like, I'm game. <laughs> That's Victor over there. Supposing your dad went away, he went to some other country, and he came back and said, this is going to be your bride. And you haven't dated or courted or anything. So all of the questions that we ask in 20th, you know, 21st, whatever century in America, this world here, well, how can I, well, I gotta know something about her, right? How can we just get married? We don't even know each other. And yet, what happened? They loved each other. You know what? Their marriage stood the test of time. And they never dated. They never courted. They didn't, even, they didn't even do what we're saying is biblical courtship. And that marriage made it. And they are a patriarch and a matriarch of our faith to this day. What about Jacob and Rachel? Rachel. Now that was a different situation. Jacob went to find his own wife. Okay? And the same thing. So now that, that problem, there was a you, we could say there was a courtship there because he had to work for seven years. And we, but the Bible is silent kind of about what happened you know, during that time period other than that he worked. And he was like, hey, this, it was like a few days for him because he loved Rachel so much, right? But the Bible doesn't say much about what happened in their relationship during that time. What about Boaz and Ruth? One of the, one of the great love stories in the Bible. Boaz and Ruth, they, they didn't court, really. I mean, they, you know, they met each other and he decided that he was going to be the kinsman redeemer. And when you read through, when you read through that passage, when, when you read through the passage closely, there's a lot said about the reason why Boaz did was what he did. And none of it was, none of it went like this. Boaz kind of looked and said, mm, ooh wee, I like her. I want to marry her. Right? There was none of that. What the scriptures show is that he was concerned about the name of the dead. Mahlon and Kilion. And he was concerned for Ruth and the kindness that she had shown. It, it, it never, the scripture never hints that this was like he fell in love with her as soon as he saw her or anything. All of his motivations are noble, and that's the reason why he's a perfect example of the kinsman redeemer of Yeshua, who's our kinsman redeemer, because he loved us even when we were unlovable. And he laid down his life for his bride, for us. Boaz is a perfect example because he didn't really know Ruth. Just, he didn't know Ruth any more than Isaac knew Rebecca. And yet, they loved each other, they were married, and their marriage lasted their entire lifetime. So I'm going to come back to that towards the end. How did their marriages work since they didn't know each other? So here, I'm going to give you my definition of courtship. I hope you like it. If you don't, it's okay. You can make up your own. Uh, but this is one I've come up with. Courtship is a premarital relationship between a man and a woman characterized by limited intimacy, 
in which they seek to determine if it is God's will for them to marry each other, and if so, to prepare for marriage. Okay? That's just how I see it now. Okay? Premarital relationship. It is characterized by limited intimacy, and we're, and we're going to talk about that in, in, a, little, in a little while. Okay? Um, in which they seek to determine if it's Adonai's will for them to marry, and if so, then to prepare for that marriage. It's all about... Are you the person that Adonai has brought into my life? That's what it's about. Are you the person who Adonai has brought into my life? Let's look at what dating is. Dating is a temporary premarital relationship between two people characterized by most and sometimes all levels of marital intimacy without the commitment to marriage in which they seek to enjoy one another's companionship, okay? So I'm just talking about dating in general, the way the world presents it to us, and the ways many of us older folks participated in it when we were younger. Dating was, you, I see a girl that I like, and so I want her to be my girlfriend, or vice versa. It could be a girl, you just, you just see someone who you like, right? How many of you dated someone how many of you dated someone because you felt that they were uh, spiritually in tune with God? Right? Are there any, any of the, some of the older folks that have, were involved in dating? Is that why you dated? Any of you men, is that why you dated some? You two. <laughs> right? You were saved already. <laughs> right? Dating is basically people want to enjoy each other's companionship. Okay? That's what it is. It's a way to enjoy the benefits of marriage without the commitment of marriage. That's what happens in dating, okay? So I want to compare dating and marriage. Well, now marriage, I'm saying, is a lifelong covenantal commitment of a man and woman who have, joined, who have been joined together by Adonai in a one flesh relationship and it's for a purpose. It's to fulfill Adonai's purposes in the world. See, marriage has a purpose in Adonai's eyes, okay? A lifelong covenantal commitment of a man and a woman who have been joined together by Adonai in a one flesh relationship to fulfill his purposes for them in the world. We got that just from the Genesis account. Adonai brought Eve to Adam and he said, you shall be one flesh. And he said, you guys are to do some things. You are to... You are to uh, be fruitful and multiply and subdue or rule the earth. There was a purpose. God gave them a holy purpose for their marriage. Okay? Whereas, when we compare that to dating, the temporary premarital relationship between two people, basically, as I said, they seek to enjoy one another's companionship. The purpose for most dating is basically the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Okay? It's basically, I like that person, right? You know, I like the way they look, I want to be with them, what have you. I mean, that's basically what it is. You want companionship with the, with, with the opposite sex, right? So you're looking for companionship and friendship. And um, now I know that there are instances where people do date uh, with marriage in mind. I, I realize that. But can we, can we all agree that that's more like the exception to the rule? I mean, in, our, in, in, in modern society now. Uh, because of the fact, as I said, people have boyfriends and girlfriends in grammar school, high school, in college, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, most dating does not have that in view, okay? All right. So one of the things that I, that I want to say is that marriage is a huge responsibility. I mean, it is humongous. It's probably one of the most important decisions that you're going to make in your life. All of our young people here, especially, you know, all of our young people, it's one of the most important decisions that you're going to make in your life. And remember what we said in that first teaching, we said that whether you're talking about the world or whether you're talking about uh, Christians, 50% of all marriages don't make it. Whether non-saved or saved, 50% don't make it, okay? So what we want to do is we want to make sure, we want to do what we can 
Nothing's guaranteed, but at least we want to do what we can to ensure that we're in the 50% that's going to make it, right? That's in the 50% that's going to make it. So before you betrothed, so knowing that marriage is this huge step that is so important, has so many consequences, before you are betrothed to be married, what should you be doing? What investments should you be making? So a lot of you teenagers, at some point, maybe even now, you know, if you're, you know, if you're 18, let's say you're 18 or 19 years old or something, you could potentially be thinking about marriage, okay? So if that is the case, before you're betrothed, what should you be doing or what investment should you be making, okay? And what I want to suggest to you is that it should be in preparation, okay? There, is, there are things you can do to prepare for marriage. And so what we want to do is we want to, we want to look at the, the, the biblical prerequisites for marriage. We want to look at those. Okay? And, all right. So here we go again. So as I said, we're going we're gonna to review what we said last week intimacy was. Because this is very important. Because one of the things, one of the, the main reason why I said last week that, 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 that teens should never date is because it involves levels of intimacy that's reserved for a man and a woman in marriage. That's the main reason why, okay? But let's look at what I mean. Intimacy, think of it this way. It means into me see. Into me see. Intimacy is a blending of our heart with another person's heart so that we can see into them who they really are and they can see into us who we really are. That's what intimacy is all about. It's not just, okay? It's about seeing into the heart of someone else and someone else seeing into your heart. That's what intimacy is, okay? It's about sharing your deepest longings, your deepest desires, your hopes, your dreams, and your fears with someone else. Those aspects of your life that the average person doesn't know about. What are your, you know, what are your fears? You don't share your fears with just anyone. Your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations in life. That's what intimacy is about. It's about sharing those things with someone else and having that other person share those things with you. That is, that is what intimacy is about. Being intimate involves the mixing of our life with another's life. It's a mingling of our souls and a sharing of our hearts. And this is something we all long for because Adonai created us to want this. Okay? He created us to want to do this. And how do we know that intimacy, how do we know that what I'm saying is correct? This idea of intimacy means into me see. Right? where we share things with someone else that no one else knows, where we long for someone else to know who we really are. And, and we want to know who that other person is. Remember what we said last week, the reason why we know that intimacy has to do with knowing someone intimately is because of the biblical euphemism for having marital relations. What is the biblical euphemism for having relations? It is, and Adam knew Eve. Right? Adam knew Eve. Why does the Bible say Adam knew Eve? So-and-so knew so-and-so. The reason why is because intimacy has to do with her knowing everything inside of here and me knowing everything inside of that heart right there. That's why it means, and the ultimate, the ultimate act of intimacy is that in the marital, in marital relations. That's the ultimate, the ultimate right there. Because in that act, the husband knows the wife. And in that act, the wife knows the husband like no one else. 
So intimacy has to do with that knowledge. The other reason why we know that is because what did Yeshua say? And this is eternal life. This is eternal life. What? That they may know you, the one and only true God and Yeshua Messiah whom you've sent, that you may know. So that's, that's what intimacy is. And that's why, that's why people can get into relationships through Facebook or over the internet People can have relation, relationships over the inter internet where they fall in love with each other and they never even seen each other. I know of two instances of this, one in my family and one in a friend, where there was a relationship started over the internet, where they began to, to talk to each other over the internet. And then, what did I say? Intimacy is about sharing parts of you that no one else knows, and that's what they began to do, and the next thing you know, they've never even, they've never seen or touched each other. Well, I mean, they've seen pictures or whatever, but they've never been with each other, and guess what? The next thing you know, one left her family to go marry someone. She left her family. She left the husband of her youth to marry someone she had never even seen or touched. Why? Because intimacy is not just, intimacy is knowing, the sharing. And that's why we were saying that teen dating is inappropriate because in teen dating, you are sharing intimacy with someone else that's reserved for marriage. All of the things involved. If it's something like holding hands, that's intimacy, biblically speaking. If you're spending lots of time talking to that person, hours upon hours talking, sharing your heart, that's intimacy. See, it may not be, but it's intimacy. Again, that's why people can have a relationship over the internet. And, and fall in love and wind up marrying each other because it's all about knowing the other person, okay? It's all about sharing those aspects. That's what, that was one of the main reasons why we said that, that team dating, it involves levels, that's why I said levels, whether it's holding hands, talking hours and hours to each other, the infatuation, all I can think about is that girl or that boy, all of that, that's reserved for the marriage relationship. Caressing the kisses, even the ones on the cheek, that's reserved for marriage relationship. Okay? So that's why we wanted, that's why we wanted to give that definition of intimacy, because if we just think it's, then it's like, okay, well, we're not doing that, so we're good to go. No, you're not. <laughs> Right? Intimacy is about knowledge. Okay, so what are the biblical prerequisites for enjoying the various forms and types of intimacy found in marriage? That's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Genesis and some of the other scriptures and say, well, what are the biblical prerequisites for enjoying the various forms and types of intimacy found in marriage? Okay, there are prerequisites for marriage. Okay, there are prerequisites for marriage. And we want to, what we want to look at is... Do teens meet those prerequisites? Okay, so in other, in, other words, in other words, marriage involves certain, well, actually, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so let me go back. We also want to look at what are the biblical purposes for marriage and the responsibilities for the married people. So we're looking at two things here. What are the biblical prerequisites for enjoying the benefits of marriage, right? What are the, what are the prerequisites for enjoying the benefits of marriage? But then also, what are the biblical purposes for marriage and the responsibilities, right? Because, and what we want to do is we want to look and see, does, does modern dating further modernize purposes for bringing a man and a woman together or not? And here's a statement I want to make. It should be plain for anyone to see that it is wrong for people to enjoy the benefits of marriage without the responsibility and the God-ordained purposes of marriage. Okay? That's what we're getting at. This is what we're getting at. 
It is not right for people to enjoy the intimacy of marriage without fulfilling the responsibility. Okay, so here's some biblical prerequisites. Age, all right? Remember we said in the biblical account, he said he brought the, man, the woman to the man, right? He didn't, he didn't bring two adolescents together. <laughs> he brought two adults together. All right, so it's, a bit, and it's between an adult man. He didn't, he didn't bring two teenagers together. He didn't bring two eighth graders together. He brought a man and a woman together. So this is what I'm saying. This is laying out for us the prerequisites for marriage, just from the biblical text. The, another biblical prerequisite for marriage. It says, the Lord God fashioned to the woman, into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. How about nine, Matthew 19, 6? So they were, they were no longer two, but one flesh. Wherefore, what God has joined, let no man put asunder. In other words, Adonai joined the man to the woman. He's the one who brought uh, the man and the woman together. Dating does not involve Adonai's choice. Rather, it's the whimsical choice of who we like, which may occur numerous times. And some of us adults that have gone through the dating thing when we were younger, if I were to ask you how many boyfriends or how many girlfriends did you have in your life, it, it's probably going to be more than one, maybe more than two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Because that's the way of the world. That's the way of the world. That's the way of dating. That is, the, that is the life that I came out of. Because that's just the way the world does it. You see someone you like, so you want to date them because you want to enjoy their, their, their presence. And it has nothing to do with whether or not Adonai has chosen that, purpose, that person for you. It is simply this. Saw that it was a delight to the eyes, that it was good for food, but in this case, another type of of physical pleasure, other than good for food, and um, desirable to make one wise. Partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in many ways, that's what happens with dating. In Genesis 1, 27 through 28, it talks about how God created man in his own image. He blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So part of the purpose for, for marriage is to be fruitful and multiply. So teens are precluded from procreation. Remember, it's not just about procreation. Remember, it's not just about procreation, just having children. And again, I want to say something. There may be, there may be uh, let's say, an 18, 18, 19 year old that may be mature enough to marry. Obviously, 18 year old people marry. I'm not talking about those, okay? I'm not talking about those who are mature enough to, to marry. I'm talking about. The, the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and some 18 and 19 year olds who are not ready. Even some who are 18 and 19 are not emotionally ready. Okay, so we're not talking about 100% everything, right? Okay. But teens are, in the, for the most part, teens are precluded from procreation because that's only supposed to be between a man and a woman. So we're, we're talking about dating, okay? We're talking about dating. And remember, procreation is not just about making babies. Remember what we said, Adonai's intent is for us to be fruitful and multiply. Why? So that we can just have a lot of physical descendants? No. It's so that we can train up those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and send them forth as arrows out into the world to witness and be a, be a witness to God and to advance his kingdom. So when the Bible says be fruitful and multiply, it's not just talking about have lots of children. There's a purpose behind having those children. It has to do with training them up. Okay? Ephesians 5.31, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Messiah and the congregation. The purpose of one of the grand purposes for marriage is to model to this world the relationship between Messiah and his body, okay? Dating does not model that to the world, okay? It doesn't model that. And so what we're getting at here is we want to do that which Adonai wants us to do. 
we want to participate in activities that Adonai has called us to participate in and that have a purpose that aligns with what his purpose is for our lives. And dating uh, does not do that. Here, who should get married? 1 Corinthians 7, 39, it says, A wife is bound by the law as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. Notice what it says here, only in the Lord, right? In other words, a believer is only to marry another believer, okay? A non-believer is out of the question. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16, in Ezra chapter 10, Remember, Ezra was pulling his beard out. You remember that? He was literally pulling his beard out because he was so upset because the children of Israel, what did they do? They got into relationships with pagans. What about Ezra? I mean, what about the incident of Baal Peor? The incident of Baal Peor. In that incident, Remember the Midianites and the Moabites, they sent their women over to cohabit with the children of Israel. Right? Remember the incident with Dina, when it says that Dina went out to look, to look over the other women of the land. And what happened to her? In Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, it says you still have those there that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam is this. The doctrine of Balaam is this, the enemy knows that he cannot defeat us because of Adonai's protection. So what does he say? I will get them to fall into sexual immorality, and that way their own God will be against them. Right? But the whole point behind all of these scriptures here is that the union between a believer and an, unbel a believer, and an unbeliever is absolutely forbidden. Okay? It is a sin to date, court, or marry unbelievers. We, that's something that we just, we, we just, you should draw the line for an unbeliever. Okay? With all of these warnings that we have. All right, why should people get married? All right, we should get married to fulfill God's plans in the world. And dating is not about fulfilling Adonai's plans. It's about fulfilling the person's plans for fellowship with the opposite sex. If people are not, if we are not in a position where we have marriage as, as, as the goal or a possibility, we shouldn't be dating, okay? We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be in, involved in these, in these types of forms of intimacy, okay? Another purpose is to fulfill the, uh, the need that Adonai has placed within us. It's not good that man should be alone. Again, dating is the wrong relationship to fulfill that need. And that's what a lot of dating is, because we have this God-given desire for intimacy and companionship with the opposite sex, right? We have this. I mean, it starts in our lives early, where we have this desire for companionship. With, and this is, this is not bad. This is good. How did I made us this way? He made it where males would be attracted to females and females would be attracted to males, right? We've all experienced that, right? <laughs> but he has a particular relationship and it's called marriage where we can fulfill that need where we can fulfill that need dating is the wrong relationship to fulfill that need how about why people should get married okay part of the reason why people should why we get married is to train and prepare for leadership and servanthood do you know of the biblical prerequisites for an elder? There's basically two, and one of them is to be able to teach. The other one is what? Running his family, right? Because marriage is an awesome and a great training ground, and all of us adults, we know that that's the truth, right? It's a good training ground for how to be a servant, right? Especially when they're little babies, right? Because it's all parents serving that little one, right? And, you know, to the point, you know, where they're mature enough to where, you know, they can, they can uh, reciprocate. But as this, at this age, teens rightly, t at this age, teens should be rightly related to their parents and siblings for preparation and leadership and servanthood, okay? Dating is, is, is not the area 
uh, when we're teens, at, at the teenage, at that development in our lives, it is uh, our relationships with our parents and our siblings that should be the relationships that are preparing us. Another reason is to be used by Adonai to impact the world. Adonai, he said that it's not good for the man to be alone, and he, he made a helper for him so that they, what? Together, they could subdue the earth. Together, they could procreate, okay? To impact and subdue this world. But Adonai has called families to work as a unit to impact the world, not, de not dating, not teen dating relationships. He's called married couples to do that to impact the world, okay? And obviously to become like Yeshua. And again, at this age, teens are rightly related to their parents and siblings for preparation and leadership and servanthood, okay? At that, at that particular age. The Bible also says that a purpose for marriage is because of the weakness of our flesh. You know, Paul's pretty, he's, he's pretty down to earth with that in 1 Corinthians 7. It says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Right? So he's saying, hey, because of those desires, get married. Okay? Get married. Have a wife. Have a husband. It's a good thing. Adonai understands. He created us so that we could enjoy that relationship. But marriage is the pathway for fulfilling our physical needs, not dating, okay? Not dating. When should people get married? When the qualifications are met, okay? Remember that what we're looking at here is we're looking at some of the prerequisites for marriage, for enjoying the benefits of marriage. We're looking, we're looking at that, and then we're saying, well, does teen dating meet those requirements? Because in teen dating, we are experiencing some of the blessings of marriage. We're experiencing much of the intimacy of marriage, even if it's, even if it's not the total uh, uh, realm of intimacy of a married couple. In dating, we are experiencing a lot of the intimacy of marriage. So, so, so are we meeting the prerequisites, though? Right? So Adam was ready. He was perfect in, carry, in character, and he was ready to fulfill Adonai's purposes. Okay? And teens are not emotionally, physically, or spiritually ready for marriage. Okay? For the most part. Okay? Now, some, obviously, there are some teens that are going to be more emotionally and physically and spiritually mature, you know, as they continue on in age. But in general, teens are not emotionally, physically, or spiritually ready because you're still growing, because you're still growing. You're still becoming the person that Adonai wants you to be. You've had limited experience on the earth in how to deal with other people, how to deal with circumstances, how to deal with pressures of life. And you've, you've had limited responsibilities. Once you become an adult and you're married and you have responsibilities, children, providing for a home, taking care of a family, things like that. Those things are to be, do are, are to be uh, done by those who are emotionally, physically, and spiritually ready for those things. And then also, Adonai is the one who determines when it's time to bring you together. At the right time, Adonai brought the woman to the man. So we know his timing was perfect. Whereas dating involves people making things happen on their timetable. I don't want to wait. I want this companionship. I really like this person. I like how I feel when I'm around this person, right? So what we're doing is we're taking matters into our own hands instead of waiting upon the Lord, instead of waiting upon the Lord. Where should people get married? Adam and Eve were under the direct spiritual authority of Adonai himself, right? There was this order in the Bible. Biblically, marriage occurs within the context of the authority of the parents and a congregation. If you have, you know, if you have a congregation, I know there are lots of places where there are just Torah study groups, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that's one of the blessings of having a congregation, so that so that we can do this the way Adam and I wants it to be done. Marriage occurs within the context of the authority of both sets of parents, okay, and the congregation. 
Dating is hardly ever performed under the authority of a congregation, parents, and family. Okay? All of the dating that I did, I didn't, I didn't bring her home and say, Mom, can I date this girl? Or I didn't ask their parents or their brothers or sisters or we didn't go to the church and say, hey, you guys agree with this? Right? Didn't get any input, input from anyone. It was just, I like you, you like me, let's date. Right? It's the way, it's the way of the world. It's the way of the world, the way they do things. Biblical order must be established in marriage where the husband is the head of the wife and Yeshua is the head over the husband. Biblical authority, this whole thing with headship is so important. The military would not work were it not for military order. You know how you have rank, right? You have, you have certain ranks. And if someone ranks higher than you and tell you to go do something, you don't just say, eh, I don't feel like doing that. Right? Eh, not today. I want to go take a nap. Major, I don't feel like doing that right now. Major, corporal, could you come back some other time? I'm busy. No. Right? The, the whole idea of authority. And even today, I mean, if we, if, we, if we look at the job place, if we look at the work environment, right? If we look at the work environment, it's the same thing. I have people that report to me. Right? I have people who report to me. I'm their supervisor. I'm their boss. And there's a certain amount of respect that they give me. I have people that I report to, and there's a certain amount of respect that I give to them. Right? It's all about authority. When, whenever, whenever authority breaks down, that's when we have chaos. If in the military, this is so important, and, and I think sometimes, I, I don't know if we think about it or not. And this type of authority, you know what? It's voluntary. In the military, it's voluntary that you're going to obey your superiors. It's an act of the will to obey a superior. It's the same thing at work or on a basketball team or a football team or what have you. People fulfill certain roles. The quarterback doesn't just say, hey, I want to be the running back and I'm going to run the ball all the time. It doesn't happen. They fulfill their roles. And if they don't fulfill their roles, that team is messed up. Right? That team is messed up if people don't fulfill their roles. And you know what? That's voluntary too. When you have a sports team, it's all voluntary. People willingly submit themselves to a coach. When I ran track, I willingly submitted myself to the coach who would run me ragged, <laughs> right? And I let him do it. I had a coach, basketball coach, who yelled at us, screamed at us, cursed at us. That was back in the days, guys. It doesn't happen much today, but back in the 70s and 60s, woo. It's a different world then, okay? Anyway, biblical authority, you, you get what I'm saying? There has to be biblical authority. There has to be biblical authority. And dating does not involve any God-ordained authority in any shape, form, or fashion, most of the time. Most of the time. It doesn't have anything to do with the authority of a congregation or the parents, etc. okay? For the most part. The male teen, and here's something else. <clears throat> The reason, one of the reasons why marriage works, biblical marriage works, is because a husband is to fulfill his role and the wife is to fulfill her role. If the husband does not fulfill his role as leader and headship over the family, and if the wife does not fulfill her role, her, her, her role to, to submit and reverence the husband, as the scripture says, that's how marriages don't work. In other words, Adonai has a certain order for the intimate relationship between a male and a female. And dating totally bypasses this, number one, because there is no, no teenage girl who's supposed to be under any teenage boy's authority in the first place. <laughs> right? That's why those relationships don't work. That's why some of us have multiple boyfriends and girlfriends throughout our lives. 
Because what happened is that's not the foundation for an enduring and a long-lasting relationship. Adonai knows that in order for a man and a woman to become one flesh, they have to fulfill a certain. They have to fulfill the the. Uh, they have to fulfill the roles that Adonai has given them. And it's very important to do that, otherwise it all breaks down. Male teens are not to teach and model personal holiness to female teens. I mean, these are all things that happen in marriage. In other words, these are all the prerequisites for marriage. In other words, if you're going to get if you're going to get, get married, if you're going to get married, one of the prerequisites, well, we'll get there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Trying to get ahead of myself. All right. Um, another biblical prerequisite is, is that you have to be committed to God honoring labor. You know, Adam had a job before he got married, right? <laughs> I just thought every time I say Adam, <laughs> Adam had a job before he got married. He did. He was tending the garden, right? Work didn't come on the scene once he got married. And so, in other words, what I'm saying is that this picture in Genesis one through two is presenting to us. A, a, a biblical picture of what marriage should be. Adam was working, right? Teens are not responsible for the type of labor to provide for a family, right? Because it's not that time in their lives yet. But these are things that happen in marriage, right? These are responsibilities in marriage. So if you're not ready, or if it's not time for you to have that responsibility for a marriage, then don't enjoy the benefits of marriage because that's not right. If we're going to enjoy the benefits of marriage, we also have to commit to the, to the responsibilities. Committed to obedience to God's commandments. Again, in general, dating bypasses, ignores, contradicts, and in many instances is antithetical to Adonai's commandments. Just the whole institution. The whole, the entire institution is against Adonai's commandments. So we're going to read here in Ephesians chapter 5. And here, the, here are some prerequisites for the husband. It says, husbands, love your wives as Messiah loved the congregation and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious congregation, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that we should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Who, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Right here, verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Notice what he says here. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Messiah and the church. Okay? So in other words, the relationship between Yeshua and the relationship between Yeshua and us, the congregation, is it, the relationship between a husband and a wife is a picture of the relationship between Yeshua and his bride. So when we look at that, again, Ephesians 5, what does it say about wives? It says wives must submit to the, to the headship of the husbands. That's a, re that's a responsibility, a prerequisite. And female teens are not called to submit to male teens. They're called to submit to their parents' authority. Okay? And again, as I said, if we don't get this, if we don't get this authority thing worked out right, there's going to be chaos. Remember we talked about how that was the problem in Genesis chapter, in Genesis chapter 3. Because the man was supposed to exercise, he was supposed to be the head of the wife, right? God was the head of Adam, Adam was the head of the wife, and together Adam and Eve were, the, uh, were to exercise dominion over the beasts of the earth. And what happened is that got all out of whack. Because when the serpent came to the woman and tempted her and got her to sin, he was exercising authority and dominion over her. And when Adam did what she said, instead of taking his role and being responsible, he was not fulfilling his role. And so he came under her authority because he didn't take his rightful place. And then both of them, it says they were trying to be like God. So they were trying to be above his authority. You see how that worked? So that whole thing with authority is, is, is a big one. 
That whole thing with, a big, with, with authority is a big one. Husbands, love your wives as Messiah loved the church and gave himself for her. Okay? That's a prerequisite for a marriage relationship. A man should be willing to give himself to his wife. And that's typically not the case with teens. They're not called to lay down their lives for each other. Now, that may be a social situation where a teen may need to protect another. But again, it's not that time of their life. It talks about that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You know how Yeshua, it says that Yeshua, he sanctifies and washes his wife with the water of the word. That's teaching us that in a marriage relationship, it is the man who is to teach and disciple his wife. See, everything that's happening right here with Yeshua and his church, Yeshua and the congregation, is a picture of what we're supposed to be doing, you know, with, 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 our, with our families, okay? And again, the teen is not responsible for discipling his girlfriend. It's just not the order. It's not the biblical order. Husbands loving their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That whole aspect of laying down our lives for one another, that is a biblical responsibility in marriage, but that is not a responsibility in teen dating, okay? And that's why, and again, the whole point that I'm making by bringing up all of these analogies is that this is the reason why teen dating is out of order, because it doesn't fulfill any of the biblical prerequisites or any of the biblical responsibilities for the type of relationship that has intimacy. Okay, that's the point. That relationship that is based on two people sharing various levels of intimacy has certain responsibilities and teen dating totally sidesteps that. Okay, go. We talked about what intimacy means. In Ephesians 6.4, it talks about children not, it talks about Fathers bringing their children up in an admonition of the Lord. And remember we said it's not just about repopulating the earth, but it's about discipling our children and sending them out as arrows. This is the responsibility of, of adults. Okay, again. So that whole point is that that intimacy, that intimacy has certain responsibilities. We cannot partake of that intimacy without the responsibilities. 1 Timothy 5, 8, does anyone, if anyone doesn't provide for his own, we talked about that. God-honoring work, right? God-honoring work. And then husbands must also be the prophet and priest of their family. Okay? And again, these are biblical roles for adults, not for teens. All right, so last couple of slides here. So how does this work? How does marriage work? Now, I got this from, from Chip Ingram. I thought it was pretty pretty good analogy that he made here. In today, today's world, this is how modern dating works. We're going to start at the bottom. The way modern dating works today out in the world and the way I partook of it is first is the physical. Right? First is the physical. Boom. I see somebody I like. Right? He's, he's cute. She's cute. Right? And there are a lot of cute people, right? And we notice them, right? Then what happens is, so we're initially attracted to fit physically, and then next is the emotional, all the infatuation. Oh, man, oh, man, I, oh, I like her so much, right? All you can do is think about and talk about that girl. That girl is on your mind 24-7. That young man is on your mind 24-7. You're emotionally getting attached. Then the social circles. That's when you open up and you start bringing that person to all your friends and everything. Remember we talk about those trophies? Remember those trophies? Sometimes those boyfriends and girlfriends are trophies that we get to show off to our friends. Then comes the psychological aspect. That's when, you know, you start getting into values. You know, what do you value? What's important to you? Okay, what are the things where you just draw the line and say, I'm not going to do this or the things that you think are important? And then, lastly, this is the spiritual, right? How many unsaved people that wouldn't even step foot in the church when it's time to get married, where do they go? To the church. They try to go get a minister to marry them, right? It's last. 
They've already been attracted physically and gotten involved physically, emotionally attached, sharing the inner social circles with each other, developed a sense of each other's values, and then finally they're like, okay, we need to get a, we need to get a, a minister. Notice that this triangle is pointing on its edge here. It can teeter this way or it can teeter that way very easily. This is Adonai's way of doing it. It's totally backwards. We're supposed to start off spiritually connecting with someone else. Are they a believer? Have they been born again? Are they, is that person living under the biblical authority of their father and mother? Is that girl under the authority of her father and mother or is she rebelling? rebelling? Is that son, is he living under the authority of his father or is he rebelling? You see, God starts right here at the spiritual level. See, dating flips this thing all the way around, and that's why it never works. And it may bring pleasure for a while, but it's going to end. Then next is the social, right? Where you, we spiritually, we know we can connect. Then socially, you're meeting the parents. You're meeting the congregation, right? This is Adonai's way of doing it. Then psychological, your values. What values do you share, right? Tina and I, we were able to share our share values before we got intimate, okay? Then you get attached emotionally because if you don't share the same values, you shouldn't get attached to that person. That's why Adonai's way is best. Because we got to take care of the spiritual aspects first. Is that person a believer? Are they walking the way the Lord wants them to, work, to walk? Bring them into the, social, into the social area of our parents, our families. Biblical courtship. In biblical courtship, those two need to have their families involved because you're, you're joining to another family. Psychological, all the values, emotional, You've got all these other bases covered. You're probably compatible. It's probably going to work, and then the marriage and the physical. So here we go, last slide. The dating formula is typically this. Again, it's from Chip Ingram. I love this because it's true. It happened in my life. You find the, the dating formula is find the right person, right? You go out, you find the right person. You go to parties, you go to whatever, boom, boom, boom. You find the right person, you fall in love. And then you fix your hopes and dreams on that person to fulfill you, right? That's what dating was all about when I was, grow when I was growing up. This is perfect. You find the right person, you fall in love, or you fall in infatuation, or you fall in like. <laughs> you fix, and all you think about is this person, and oh, they're just the dream of my life, and they're going to make me feel so good. And then, guess what? If, if, you, if you fail, just repeat steps one through three. Right? And I, I, I've done that. And many, many of the older adults here, you, you, you did that when, when you were growing up and when you were a child. Adonai's formula is this. You be the right person. I love this. Be the right person. Don't go and try to find the right person. Be the right person. And that's the reason why Rebecca, why Eliezer chose Rebecca because he knew she had a servant's heart because of the test that he proposed before Adonai. Let the wife or my master's son be the one who comes and draws water for me, right? And she said, I'm going to draw water for you and for these 10 camels. And we talked about how a camel could drink, a thirsty camel could drink up to 25 gallons of water apiece. And it says how she ran back and forth. She ran to the well back and forth to, 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 to get water for all of those camels. So she was a servant. And so she, she was a servant. She was being the person. So that when the right time came and Eliezer showed up, Adonai brought her to the man that he wanted her to be, to, to, to me. 
With Tina and I, the same thing happened. Because I said we didn't we didn't date as we got to know as, as we initially got to know each other. We weren't dating. We were we were with her friends. And she won my heart. Want to know how? Because you guys know, is there a woman in here who's working all the time? Who's serving people all the time? She was doing that when she was 20-something years old. And it won my heart. It won my heart. That's the woman for me. So it's all about being the right person. Right now, in, in, in this time of your lives, team, teens, this is the time for you guys to be the right person, to learn how to be a servant, learn how to love Adonai with all your heart, learn how to share your gifts with other people, learn how to serve other people, and then walking in love. Instead of falling in love, walk in love. You, all of the adults, the adults that took our marriage, the marriage course that we did, did you notice how when it came to working out problems that, that what Chip said is we need to focus on who? Did, were we supposed to focus on the other person? No. He said focus on. That's how relationships work. And then you fix your hopes and dreams on God and seek to please him. That's a formula for success. That's what happened to Ruth. That's why her and Boaz, they didn't need to date. They didn't, need, they didn't even need courtship. You see, Boaz, he knew of Ruth's kindness to Naomi. You see? So he knew she was a winner. <laughs> he knew she was a keeper. He didn't have to date her to find out what kind of woman she was because her works of righteousness preceded her. Same thing happened with my beloved, with the, the, the service. 